Okay, thank you. And good morning, everybody. Really good happy morning, to be Bill. here with you all today. Um, you're probably looking at the title here and then looking at my job title at AppGeo and wondering what the heck that means. Uh, hopefully, you'll get a little bit of a window in that in this presentation. I've been to lots of GIS meetings, lots of conferences, and get togethers over the years, and almost all of them involve talks about GIS methods, GIS data, uh, processing, and how to, how to make this stuff work. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to be talking about the why part of this, and specifically why you should care about GIS strategic planning. And I really want to have just a very simple goal. I want you to be able to walk away from this meeting today with a feeling for the heart of why this matters, why this is an important thing to do. So I'm going to start briefly with um, just a little background about me and my career. Uh, I'm a career-long GIS guy. Um, worked the majority of my career in the state of New York. Uh, I started out in 1984 in the Mapping Services Bureau at the New York DOT. And so there I am, in, you know, early in my career, proudly eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on white bread. <laughs> That's the lunch. Uh, but I've had a, I've had a really um, amazingly wonderful career in GIS. Uh, I happen to have been born at the right period of time, so that when I was ready to enter the workforce, the mapping <coughs> discipline was just on the start of changing over from photomechanical, kind of a manual production method to digital. And so I was there at the kind of the early start of the transformation of GIS from analog to digital, which was really a fascinating uh, thing to, to go through. Um, I'm not going to bore you with details about my career. Just to show you a little timeline here, I started at the bottom rung in the state of New York, a mapping technologist one. 31 years later, I retired as the state geographic information officer at the top rung. And I'm really very, very proud of that. Um, it looks like I bounced around a bunch of agencies and uh, couldn't hold the job very well. But in fact, it was pretty linear. The, the organization at the New York DOT, that mapping shop, eventually morphed into what is today the GIS program office. So I basically followed the mapping function as the state was figuring out how to consolidate uh, resources into a centralized IT agency and so forth. We, we went through a sequence of home before we ended up in this new agency that's now the Information Technology Agency. And Frank Winters, who I worked with for 25 plus years, close friend, close colleague, almost like a brother to me, uh, Frank uh, took over as GIO two years ago, almost three years ago now after I retired from the state of New York. Since then, I went and I spent two years in Washington, D.C. at a large nonprofit as their GIS director, so I've got a little bit of exposure on the national scene. And then last April, I joined Applied Geographics, which is a group I've known for 30, 30 plus years. Uh, and, and so working there now. Uh, so that's, that's all I'm going to tell you about my GIS career. I just wanted you to have a, a little bit of a sense for what I've been through. And one of the things that I've, uh, you know, as you get a little older, and you, you gain more and more experience, you start to look in the rearview mirror more. And you start to recognize some patterns. And I have recognized a pattern in my career, and I want to explain that to you. <coughs> um, this is Latin, carpe diem. I'm sure many of you, or if not all of you, are familiar with this. It translates literally to seize the day. Seize the day. And carpe diem is often used in the context of living in the moment, getting the most out of the here and now. You know, and because it's a bit of a difference <coughs> to carpe diem, and it's about taking a chance, seizing an opportunity to do something better, kind of getting outside your comfort zone and go exploring, taking a bit of a risk. And that's a, that's a definition of carpe diem that you don't see as often, but it is, it is really the deeper meaning of carpe, carpe diem. And what I've seen when I look in the rearview mirror of my career is the pattern is that never did we get someone come to us with a very clear set of GIS requirements, that this is exactly what I need you to do, that we could take those requirements and kind of translate it into a GIS workflow and execute. I mean, I wish that were the case, but that never happened. Instead, what would happen is people would come to our shop and say, I need a map. Can you give me a map of this? Or, hey, we're working on some reports. Uh, we want to include some maps in this report, and that starts a dialogue. Or, 
Bill, I hear you're the mapping guy. We have some mapping needs. And those innocuous little requests, when you dig a little deeper, they start a conversation. And you start to ask some questions and some give and take. What you find is, very often, that conversation leads to something very different than what that little innocuous request might have been. And that gives you a chance to go explore, to try some things out. Maybe connect the dots on something you've seen earlier in your career. Or try a technique that you've read about but haven't tried. And, and eventually, with some experimentation, you solve, the, you solve the problem. But you probably end up in a very different place than what was conceived of at the start of that. And that, I find that process fascinating. And in the world of GIS, I call that Carpe Geo. And Carpe Geo isn't about the methods of doing GIS. It's about a process. It's about an ethic, actually. About a willingness to, to go on a journey and solve these problems, not knowing where that journey is going to lead. And so Carpe Geo is about working to make government work better, solve problems in ways that you're not sure about, help people get a deeper understanding about the issue that they're exploring. Really, it's about making the world a better place. It's about seizing the opportunity to do great things with GIS. And when you do that, that's Carpe Geo. Now, I want to give you an example of how this works. Um, this is an example that goes back to 2012, Superstorm Sandy. I'm sure virtually all of you were here in the city for that. Is that true? Um, so what I'm going to show you is probably familiar territory, but it's my favorite little example, so you're going to have to indulge me as I go through it one more time. But Superstorm Sandy, as you know, struck the city of New York right after Labor Day in 2012 and created that massive flooding in lower Manhattan, subway tunnels, Underwater, power substations knocked out, Lower Manhattan out of power for a couple days. Disastrous event in the city's history. And the governor created uh, two commissions at the, at the end of that, or uh, shortly thereafter. And one of them was called the 2100 Commission, the NYS 2100 Commission. And that's the actually the cover page of the report and the web page that they stood up at the time. The 2100 Commission was tasked, well, it was staffed up with luminaries from academia, from engineering companies, you know, top experts in infrastructure that come together and they had a two-month timeline to make recommendations on the city's infrastructure with the thinking that over the next hundred years, kind of between 2012 and 2100, virtually every piece of infrastructure is either going to be replaced or have major uh, repair and rehab work done on it. So what do we do? with that infrastructure to be more resilient in that time window. That's what the 2100 Commission was tasked with doing. So these guys were off and working. And I was sitting in my office in Albany, New York, uh, in probably November of 2012, and I got a phone call. And it was a woman from the governor's office. And she called me up and she said, Bill, I hear you're the mapping guy. <laughs> yes. She said, we have this uh, governor set up this 2100 Commission and we're working on a tight timeline to develop a report. And we need some maps for that report. Can you help? Now, I don't know about you, but when I get a call from the governor's office, I'm always going to answer yes to those kinds of requests. So of course I told her yes. And in the course of digging a little deeper with her, asking her a little bit more about the maps she needed, it quickly became clear that she didn't know exactly what maps the commission needed for her report. And so this was one of those Carpe Geo opportunities. And so what I understood was they were looking for maps to help understand what had happened with the flooding and what its impact had been on infrastructure. And that was the sum total of really what she was able to articulate to us about these maps she needed. So Frank and I and others on the team back in Albany started batting ideas around. And one of the things I had seen much earlier in my career was when the state first started dabbling in digital ortho imagery, we had a guy in our coastal program who had taken the very first batch of orthos that I, uh, I think I ever encountered in my career uh, for the south shore of Long Island, those barrier islands on the south shore of Long Island. And he had taken also scans of maps from the 1890s. And he overlaid those scans with the ortho photos. 
And those barrier islands along the south shore of Long Island are very ephemeral land forms. They're basically sandbars that shift and move. And when you overlay the 1890 maps with the, with the ortho imagery, you could see massive change. And I, that had stuck in the back of my mind. And so when we were talk, uh, thinking about what to do for the 2100 Commission, I thought, hey, maybe we should see if there's been much shoreline change in lower Manhattan. And I didn't really know what we were going to find there. I guess I had, over the years, heard little bits of anecdotal evidence that there had been some fill and the shoreline had been modified a bit by, you know, as we developed the city. But I didn't know much more than that. So I started making some phone calls uh, so we could chase down the data to do a, a time sequence analysis. And to do that, you need current shoreline, you need an original shoreline, and then you need some time, you know, what did the shoreline look at different slices of time? And I didn't have any of that data. We didn't have any, well, we had the current shoreline, I guess, from, um, from Do It. Um, so I started making some phone calls. And this, by the way, is one of the things that makes your network, your professional network, so valuable. Knowing where you can turn to find the things that you need, which is part of what comes out of strategic planning, but I don't want to spoil the game here. Uh, and so I made a bunch of phone calls. And I eventually called one of my colleagues, and I'm sure you know, Steve Romaluski. He was at uh, Nyberg at the time. And Steve said, oh, Bill, you need to talk to Matt Knudsen at the New York Public Library. And I had never met Matt. Matt and I didn't know each other at all. But uh, I got his phone number from Steve, and I called Matt. And now, how many of you know Matt? Good. Uh, you know, he, at the time, was the map librarian at the New York Public Library. They're in the main branch office in the Schwartzman building on Fifth Avenue, down in the lower level. And I called Matt and told him what we were doing. And Matt got very excited because he'd been working away scanning and ortho-rectifying and, and uh, geo-registering maps out of that collection. And they weren't getting a lot of use. And when he heard that these things could end up in a report for the governor's commission, he was very excited about that. So he said, I'm pretty sure I'll be able to come up with what you need. And that was late in the afternoon. I don't remember which day of the week it was. But the following morning, I got to work. And I got a phone call right away from Matt. And he said, Bill, I've got what you need. And he had already uh, searched his collection. And, had, and, and actually, he sent me a list of URLs. He had actually posted the data on a site for me to access directly. It was great. And I'm going to show you what those maps look like if you haven't seen them before. So this was a very interesting thing. So um, we put this together as a presentation. <coughs> Frank and I went to the, the 2100 Commission had, a, I don't know, two or three meetings. Two, and we, Frank and I were both of them. Uh, they were very interesting meetings. And at the second meeting was where we made this presentation. In fact, the seat was on December 18th, 2012. They had a very busy agenda. I had 10 minutes on the agenda to give this presentation just before lunch. Uh, and basically, before I go through this, let me just tell you that in terms of GIS, this is nothing. All this is is a stack of maps where you're looking at the change from one map to the next. There's no, there's no fancy analytics. There's no complicated processing here. This is the kind of thing a first year GIS student could do pretty easily. Not, so it's not that it's sophisticated, but I want to, you know, let's see what you think. So here we are at Lower Manhattan. The very first image we needed was the undisturbed shoreline. What did it look like before the city started to get developed? Now luckily, and I should have told you this earlier, another one of the recollections I had was I had met Eric Sanderson. He had done a presentation at, a, at actually one of our state conference events up in the Finger Lakes some years earlier on the Manhattan Project. Some of you may have heard of that project. It was actually a cover story of National Geographic magazine probably 15 years ago now. But what they, I mean, the premise of the Manhattan Project is the island of Manhattan is one of the most altered landscapes on the planet. And so, you know, uh, Eric was with the Wildlife Conservation Society. I believe he still is with the Wildlife Conservation Society. Here he's based in the city. They run the Bronx Zoo, by the way. Uh, and he was looking at the changes in kind of the natural landscape. But it worked very well here. So Eric had created this digital representation of the undisturbed lower Manhattan shore, actually the whole island. So we, we were able to get that. And then the first map in the collection that Matt gave us was from 1660, when there was a very tiny little Dutch settlement, basically a fortress at the southern tip of, of the island. 
And you can see, you know, Henry Hudson sailed into the harbor in 1609 in the half moon. And that's when Western civilization first made contact here in Manhattan. So only, only 51 years later, you know, there's a thriving little start of a city uh, in lower Manhattan. And uh, you can see that that map fits the original shoreline very well. There's very little change in the first 50 years. But then we, we skip ahead. The next map Matt gave you is from 1767, just on the verge of the, of the American Revolution. And what I've done here is shaded blue everything that's different from 1609 to here. And you can see that there's incredible change. Well, what's going on? Well, first of all, 100% of the traffic coming in and out of New York arrives and departs by ship. There are no roads to anywhere else. You're, going, you're, not, going to, you're not going to venture overland. If you're going to get to Richmond, you're going to, you're going to get on a boat and go to sail down the coast and go in that way. So everybody's arriving by ship. The ships, you know, they're big sailing ships. They need six, eight feet of water. So you've got to build piers out to them to get in. And what was the natural shoreline? Tidal, marshy, swampy, wetland. So they built these piers out to, to be able to accommodate the ships. And then all the waste that they had, shells from oysters that they harvested in the bay. You dig a cellar hole, you got material, you dump it between the piers. Ballast that was in the ships that they needed to jettison, throw it into the, throw it into the bay. So all of this material is already, just before the American Revolution, we've already started to expand that, that new swampy natural shoreline in Manhattan. We move ahead to 1817. The city is growing. People are digging more and more cellar holes. There's more waste material. There's more ships, so we have more piers, more activity. The piers are longer and bigger. And so this, the shoreline continues to grow. We get to 1860. And in 1860, the city had actually created an ordinance, a, a city law, basically, that limited the length of the piers. So, that they, so everybody built their piers out to, the, out to the limit line there. And, uh, and now we see a lot more activity in the Hudson up on the west side here. And New York is becoming a more and more important port. So there's more commercial traffic, more ships, bigger ships. So it's growing and growing. We get to 1924. And 1924, just 21 years after Wright Brothers' first flight, the city engineer commissions aerial photos for the city. So there's actually aerial, there's an aerial photo mosaic for of the city from 1924. I find that absolutely amazing. And so there it is. And you can see, you can actually see ships docked at the piers. But you can also see how we've grown yet again from the last photo. And finally, we get to current uh, <coughs> imagery. And you can see that over those 400 years, the width of lower Manhattan is pretty much tripled based on all the, all the growth and this reclaimed landfill land. And um, here's what makes it really interesting. When you overlay the storm surge from Superstorm Sandy, which is yellow on here, you see that it fits almost perfectly the man-made reclaimed land, except for a few areas that were marshy and shallow all along. And when we showed this to the 2100 Commission, this had a very profound effect on, on what happened here. I want to talk about that for a minute because that was an amazing experience for me. And Frank was there too. I gave that presentation just before lunch. They broke for lunch. During lunch, a whole bunch of the commissioners serving on that group uh, came over and talked to Frank or I to tell us how amazed they were with that and how it changed their thinking about what was going on here. And then when the group reconvened after lunch, the policy discussion had taken a clear pivot. And speaker after speaker in their remarks referenced the material we had shown them. And to me, that was one of the most potent moments in my career, to see that the work we had done with GIS had changed a policy, a very important policy discussion. And I think that is the highest level of achievement in GIS. Don't you all want to be in a spot where your work can uncover the truth, can enlighten the policymaker, on the dimensions, on the underlying cause and effect of some issue that they're trying to explore. I think that's where we all want to be with GIS. And so the question now is, what do you do to increase the chances that you can be in that position? 
Because believe me, if you've been in a position like that, and Frank and I have experienced it, you want it again. Here's another Latin phrase. This is probably new to you. Anybody know what this translates to in Latin? Argo moment it means small moments. Small moments. I put that on there because several times in my career I've experienced something that happened. And in that moment, it gave me a realization of how important the work that we were doing was. And, and in that realization, it reaffirms your sense of purpose and kind of revitalizes you and keeps you going. I'm going to give you two examples of that. The first one um, is a bit of an older example, probably 20 years ago. In the early days of when the state of New York was finally getting organized around statewide GIS, it was kind of, uh, if you looked at my career timeline, it was probably in the first, about a third of the way through that. And we had, a, we had the nucleus of a state office set up, and we were working on a bunch of additions. We stood up a state GIS clearinghouse where we could post data. We were working on a standardized street centerline file, which required, we had three different state agencies that were all working on street centerline files and we were competing about that. And we, we were able to coalesce those and get agreement to maintain one under a set of good rules. And we had set up something called a, a data sharing cooperative to try to encourage local governments to make their parcel data available. And we started an ortho imagery program to you know, fly the state and make the imagery available so everybody had a common base map to tie their GIS data to, which is kind of the, the foundational level stuff to, for our state office to be doing. So we were doing all this work. It was a very busy time. Um, and the, the work was consuming us. I think we were excited about what we were doing. But I can tell you that personally, I, didn't, I wasn't able to attach great meaning to it because I wasn't sure how people were using this information. Well, that changed for me one afternoon. I live in the town of Gilder in New York. And I, uh, at the time, took our, my, my, my two oldest daughters at the time were in elementary school. We stopped at the library once a week. They would turn in the books that they had checked out last week, pick out some new ones, and I had a few minutes to kill. So we were at the library on our weekly run. And on the side of the library, there's a, there's a couple of community rooms. And in one of the community rooms, I saw on the wall, that what hadn't been there the week prior, there were a whole series of maps hanging up on the wall. And I thought, oh, geez, I'm a cartographer. Let me go see what these maps are. Well, unbeknownst to me, the town planner had started posting materials for a new draft master plan for the town. So I went and looked at those, and on those maps were our street centerline files our ortho imagery, the parcel data from Albany County that had joined our data sharing cooperative unknown to me and had posted their data. And I looked at it and I realized the work that I was doing in the office was directly connected to something going on in my hometown to make my town a better place. And that was a very powerful moment for me. I stood there and I could feel my heart beating in my chest and I, it stopped me cold. And suddenly, it all made sense to me. And it really re-energized me when I got back to work the following day and was able to share that story with my colleagues. That's what I'm talking about with Parvo Momentum. Now, my other story is one that um, Al was already alluding to, and that is what happened with 9-11. Uh, now, I'm going to breeze through these kind of quickly. What had happened, I was actually in St. Louis at the National States Geographic Information Council conference uh, when, on that fateful Tuesday morning when we all turned on the TVs and saw the horrifying footage of those planes flying into the towers. And a couple of us uh, finally found a rental car and we drove 28 hours straight to get back to the Northeast, get back to Albany, and then we immediately talked to Al to see what he needed. And again, this was that connection that Al spoke to and, and the value of having, having that, that professional relationship. And Al said, can you guys get the imagery for us? We need, we need imagery. He didn't have much detail about what to do there. We immediately called the governor's office, got approval to do an emergency contract. And we, we had just started the state ortho imagery program. So we had already been in discussions with a bunch of the vendors in the industry. And we, within 24 hours, we had uh, Earth data mobilized their crews and their gear and were in Albany with an aircraft 
with a van, with, with workstations set up, to, to, and, and we were able to start the next day on an imagery program. And what we did was um, we collected digital ortho imagery. So we, these were flights taken from Albany. There, it's about an hour by air to come down. They were taking uh, a morning flight just at daybreak to, when the searchlights were turned off, but there was enough daylight to catch thermal imagery because you wanted the thermal imagery be captured when there's not the heat from the searchlights and there's not the heat from the sun on the objects. Then they would come back in the middle of the day and do LIDAR and orthoimetry. And so let me just show you a few quick examples. So these were daily flight missions. So there's a zoom in on the orthos. It was half foot resolution orthoimetry. LIDAR data. The LIDAR wasn't collected every day, but we did it a couple times a week. And they were able to do the calculations to see you know, how much volume of materials was yet to be removed and those kinds of things. And then this is a pretty interesting visualization. You can see and calculate the, the volumes of lost, you know, what had been lost in those buildings. Um, thermal imagery, uh, if you remember from the incident, there were fires burning deep in the rubble pile. There were buried propane tanks that were a source of fuel for that. And so knowing where the hot spots were was very important to the safety of the people working on the site. And this is, uh, I have a couple shots here. This is the, actually the thermal camera that was used. This is a this is the port in the hold in the belly of this, this aircraft you're going to see in the next picture. That thermal camera was actually a handheld camera used to walk through buildings to take, you know, we could see where heat was leaking out of buildings. It wasn't even a digital camera, it was an analog camera. And it was connected to a, to a, uh, a VCR, a uh, video cassette deck in the aircraft to record the imagery. And then back in the office they would do a playback and then do screen captures and then take those screen captures and geo-register them. That's how we did the thermal imagery. Um, and that's the aircraft. The, the, the aerial photo industry basically uses second-hand little uh, commuter planes like this. It's a turbo, turbo prop. You know, they rip out the seats and they put in some racks with, with uh, computer <coughs> gear and the LiDAR sensor and the aerial photo sensor and in this case the thermal camera. And that's, that's taken in at the airport in Albany with uh, with the crew as they just came back. So what they were doing was taking these missions, they would get back to Albany, pull the hard drives out of the rack, bring the hard drives into our office, which is in my next photo here. So this was a computer training room in our office in Albany. We pushed all the training desks off to the side. We had a bunch of workstations in there that Earth Data had brought. And the hard drives were whisked in here. And then they crunched through all the data. It took eight to 10 hours and burned it to CD because we did not have a live network connection in the first three or four weeks to get data to the emergency operations center, which was set up on Pier 92. And so in the, at the end of the day, when the data was ready, we handed them to a state police trooper who raced down the throughway with the lights on to deliver those CDs to the pier at Pier 92. That's how, that's how the network operated in 9-11. And this is what it looked like on Pier 92. I came down to the pier uh, one time to meet with some folks, and I brought a camera with me. And I actually wasn't even sure if I would be allowed to take pictures. I thought I might get my camera confiscated. And I, I, I learned after the fact there's very few pictures of what it looked like inside the pier. People were heads down getting the work done. So I have some of the, some of the known photos that exist. It's a massive pier. It's one of these piers that you know, the cruise ships dock at and, you know, get, Ready to go. And it was completely outfitted with computer gear in a very short period of time to be the emergency operations center during, during the 9-11 event. So that's what it looked like inside. And then kind of back on the right side of the pier, this was the emergency mapping and data center that Al and his colleagues set up. And, um, and it was all donated equipment. And you'll see maps. And they, they were every, people were working on multiple shifts round the clock to keep things updated and a um, series of uh, high output, uh, wide format plotters. And as you looked around the pier, not just in the mapping area, but everywhere you turned, you, you saw maps hanging up. Maps were so essential to the operation. I think so much was changing on a daily basis. Which buildings had been inspected and were deemed to be safe? Where was the water safe? Which, which streets had been blocked off for security perimeter, which was a very fast changing thing. And so on, all kinds of information like that that need to be updated every day. 
And he, you know, so again, these are, these are more maps that were posted. Just as he came in, they had these numbered maps, and they had a sheet. These are the maps for you know, 10 o'clock this morning. Here's the latest maps. And, um, and that's what it was like. Now, what happened as a result of that? Well, the people came together because there was a common purpose. There was a rallying cause. There was something that unified everybody. That people feel a basic need to help. And so the GIS people in the city of New York rallied around what they knew how to do, and they cooperated around GIS to make this emergency mapping operation happen. It wasn't organized ahead of time. It was organized on the fly for the event. And what happened there? Well, all the old barriers, the barriers between agencies, the barriers to access to data sets, the bureaucratic barriers that stymie and stop and slow down the processes on a daily basis, those all fell away. People came together. They made it work. They figured it out. They worked together around this common cause. And that's a really, really powerful thing. And I guess we have to ask ourselves, where are we at now? Well, that's a question you're better able to answer about New York City GIS than I can. But from my vantage point in Albany, what it looks like to me is that after the horror of 9-11 began to recede, that common cause, that common unifying purpose gradually faded away. It wasn't replaced by a new common cause, a new rallying point. And so you all gradually returned to the new normal, whatever that might be, after 9-11. But you all gradually returned to your old ways of doing business your agency-centric ways of doing business. And that's a, that's a hard thing to, to recognize. I don't think anybody <laughs> deliberately planned to, to pull the rug out from under that glue that had brought you together and had shown you how powerful working together could be. But it that fabric gradually unraveled. What if? So thinking about today, I think it's fair to ask, what is it that we want? What is it that we can imagine and envision about where the city of New York could be with GIS? What future do we want for GIS? What if all the data you want was easy to find and you could know its characteristics? You could know who's maintaining it and the fact that it is being maintained. And you could have an easy way to connect to it. What if you knew where all your colleagues were, both in the city and upstate, and you knew what they were working on? What if you had a way to share pieces of functionality that you guys are probably tripping over yourselves, redundantly building some of the same things over and over again? What if you knew how your little piece of the jigsaw puzzle fit the big puzzle? Think of how powerful that could be. Think about the potential you could unlock if that were the case. I apologize here. Yeah, so that power of working together is what strategic planning is all about unleashing. So I want to tell you a little story about power. Now, in the job I took in Washington, D.C., a place called the Universal Service Administrative Company after I retired from the state. I was the GIS director there. They had no GIS. This was an organization running a nationwide broadband program to expand broadband across the U.S. for the FCC. It's a $10 billion annual program distributing money into every little corner of the United States. Can you imagine they weren't using GIS? So getting there, I mean, talk about low-hanging fruit. It was low-hanging fruit all over the ground uh, there. And so I started trying to uh, go around. We had four operating divisions at USAC, and I was trying to understand how GIS could help them by learning their business requirements. But what I discovered very quickly is nobody there 
could tell me what they wanted GIS to do for them. It's very hard to envision something that you've not been exposed to. So I embarked on a quick little proof of concept project. I actually had Antio help it, the company that I'm with now. And we gathered up samples of real data from each of the four divisions, and we worked up real examples of all the different ways that GIS could be helping USAC. And we did this in a really short timeline, like eight weeks or something like that. Kate probably still has bruises from that. <laughs> and, uh, and that culminated in a, in a demonstration to the board of directors of the company. They had their quarterly board meeting, and that was what drove the tight timeline. I wanted to be able to put it in front of the board. And I gave that presentation in July of 2016, and I was standing up, going through these examples for them, and one of the board members held up his hand and he stopped me, and he said, Bill, you are unleashing something incredibly powerful. You're like Oppenheimer. <laughs> and he was referring, of course, to Robert Oppenheimer, the lead scientist in the Manhattan Project that developed the atomic bomb during World War II. And I'll have to say, that is the first time I've heard GIS <laughs> equated to nuclear weapons. <laughs> but he had a good point. GIS is incredibly powerful. Each of you has that power at your fingertips. And there's power that you can put to use for good purposes. And one of those good purposes is truth-telling. GIS sits at the crossroads, very interesting position. It's a multidisciplinary endeavor, GIS. It sits at the crossroads of policy, and technology, and data, and analytics, and visualization. And we can blend these things together in a very powerful way to uncover these patterns and expose the truth. And what I really like about that Manhattan shoreline sequence is that it exposed a very basic truth. The truth is, Superstorm Sandy wasn't some freak accident of nature. It was the result of 400 years of human activity that basically created a new artificial floodplain, one that we've densely filled with urban infrastructure. We created the problem. And that's what the maps tell us. Now, my apologies here. I actually got a little out of, I got a little out of order here on my on my notes that I wrote last night, so I think I've got to pause for just a moment here. So I think what we want to do next is is figure out how we can capture this energy around working together to do powerful things. How can we how can we position you to be in the position to be able to do this kind of truth telling, to be able to influence policymakers, and to get there. I'm going to invoke some imagery, maybe a little bit familiar to you. <laughs> uh, I owe a debt to L. Frank Baum, uh, who wrote The Wizard of Oz. It was a best-selling children's story, published, first published in 1900, and then later popularized by the 1939 movie. And it's a cultural milestone. Everybody recognizes this. And it may be a little corny, but I think it fits our purposes here pretty well. What we have is Dorothy, the Tin Man, the Scarecrow, the Lion, on their way to the Emerald City, off on the horizon. And the Emerald City represents that vision. It's the place they want to be, where when they get there, some problems will be solved. There'll be a better, there'll be a better brighter future when they get to the Emerald City. It's the incarnation of that united purpose, that common cause. It's the thing that they, they are willing to put in the effort to go and, go and reach. That's the vision piece that's so important. And that yellow brick road, that's the path between where we are today and where we want to be. It lays out the steps that we need to take, the things that we need to do together so that we don't get lost, we don't get misdirected, but it will take us to that place that we envision for that bright future. And who are the lion, the scarecrow, the tin man, and Dorothy? Well, they're your stakeholders. And look how different they are. They're very different. They come from different backgrounds. 
They have different needs. They're each seeking something different when they get to the Emerald City. But it's the common cause. It's that, that rallying around the vision and having a clear way to get there that's uniting them in one mission, one journey together. Without that, they'd be off doing their own things. They'd be taking separate paths and not harnessing that power of working together. And one other ingredient here that's worth talking about is that there's a leader in this journey. It's Dorothy. She's the one that is able to convince them about the bright future that awaits them in the Emerald City and convinces them to join her on that journey. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the role of a GIS leader because I think it's what's one of the things that's needed is for you guys to think of yourselves as latter-day Dorothys that need to unite around getting to a, an Emerald City. I'm going to talk about these skills, these leadership skills around how you do that. Um, and I'm using a familiar analogy here. Think about your GIS career as GIS. On the bottom of the stack here, you've got your base layers, base map. These are things like your knowledge about the fundamentals of GIS, and your ability to write and communicate and organize and perform the, basically perform the functions of GIS in a modern kind of way. And then these, these thematic layers, these overlays that sit on top of that base map, are things like your approach to solving problems, your ability to read the tea leaves and know what's going on, your ability to get people to work with you and join you. And we're going to talk about these through three different lenses. I've given a presentation previously where I talked about these as, as these lenses as models, and I, I gave them kind of faux scientific names so they would look scholarly, but they're, they're really just figments of my imagination looking at, my, looking, looking at things in the rearview mirror. So the first of these ways of thinking about this leadership skill set, in other words, how you could be the modern day Dorothy, is the, the GIO time allocation model. Now all of you, make decisions on a daily basis about how you spend your time. Whether you make those decisions deliberately or just out of habit, you're still making them. And so the first thing is to think about how are you spending your time. And when I started out as the state GIO in New York, that was in May of 2013, May 14th to be exact. Not that that date is significant to me in any way, shape, or form. Um, but uh, I decided I wanted to get some grounding and I interviewed the eight, what I considered at that time, the eight top state GIOs around the country. And you can see their names and which states they were with. One of them was uh, Mike Byrne, who was originally the uh, California CIO and had gone on to the FCC, and I knew him. So those are the eight people I interviewed. And I asked them a series of questions, and then I, I sifted through the data, and I, I summarized it this way. And what was very interesting to me is that the people skills, the things around consensus building and communication and getting buy-in and leadership, that was the bulk of what made people successful in this role. And that was a very important thing for me to understand. That it wasn't about me being technically savvy. It was about having that leadership skill set, those people skills. Because if you're going to, if you're going to lead an endeavor, you have to be able to convince others that there's a vision out there that's worth joining you on, that they're willing to commit their time and effort and energy to join the parade. And that's the, that's the key takeaway from this. I will point out two other things that are kind of interesting from, from this. One is that the technology pieces of this, which are the ones in red, um, only amount to about 25% of the pie. In my experience, people in the GIS world spend the preponderance of their time talking about the technical issues. When in fact, those are, those are not necessarily the most important things. One of, the, one of the things I remember, two of the eight people I interviewed told me that they viewed the technology as something that they were found attractive, but they knew it was taking their time away from more important things, but they couldn't help themselves. <laughs> I thought that was really, really interesting. And the other thing that I found interesting was that policy, which is re policy is really the rule book around how everybody engages. How do you all work together on an enterprise basis? You really need that rule book. Um, and 
almost everybody recognized that they weren't spending enough time on policy, even though they knew it was important. And I thought that was really interesting too. So, I'm going to shift now to another one of these lenses or models, how we look at those overlay skills to be a latter day Dorothy. We're calling this one the GIO Career Maturity Model. Now, when I think back about how I started my career, I began, like I imagine many of you did, as a techie. Uh, we had just taken delivery of a new Intergraph system at the New York State DOT, and it required a dedicated team to manage that system. Write user commands, train users, do the, uh, the file and uh, access and management, scripting, a whole bunch of things. It was 100% technical work. And frankly, I loved it and was pretty good at it. I was excited about doing the work. I was thinking about the work when I wasn't at the office. I was eager to get in in the morning and get back at it. It was an exciting time. And in due course, I was rewarded with a promotion. And that promotion meant that I had to do less of that technical work that I love so much and had to do some new things that, frankly, I wasn't as interested in doing. Because along with that promotion, I was now responsible for overseeing some other technicians who were running the system. So I had to keep track of their work and, and assess the quality of their work and uh, have a production log and do, do some of these other things that, in my mind, uh, were a lot less enjoyable, a lot less satisfying. But of course, in due time, I put on my big boy pants and, and adjusted to it. And each step up required that I shift. <coughs> and I shifted more and more away from those technical activities. And it gradually became more about things like motivating people, understanding the big picture outside of your direct workflow doing things and taking initiative before the boss asks for it. These are the things you grow into. And in order to have the space to grow into them, you have to shed some of those other things. And that's what the GIO career maturity model is all about. Some people plateau because they are unable or unwilling to give themselves the space to grow up into that next level of, of things that they have to do because they're too attached to some of those early career skills that they don't want to let go of. And, you know, when I think about my own career, I think about, even though it's all been GIS, and it's all been in the context of the same body of work, the nature of the work that I grew into as a GIS leader was very different than the work I started my career doing, which was hands-on technical work. And if you think about your own career, and you think about what it takes to become a GIS leader, you might realize that you need to carve out some more space for yourself to grow into those functions and maybe shed some of those earlier things so that you can morph from a GIS chrysalis into a GIO butterfly. And my third model is the uh, half-life model. Now, you remember high school chemistry? You probably learned about half-life in the context of radioactive isotopes. Am I bringing back painful memories of high school chemistry? <laughs> well, half-life is a, is a nice concept here because it's, it's um, basically the time it takes for something to decrease by half. So if we're thinking about the value, the lasting value of things in GIS, I, I like half-life as, as just a concept. Now, you can't see this very well, but this little graph here is a graph from Moore's Law. You've probably all heard of Moore's Law. Moore's Law actually is about the density of transistors on a, on a chip. Uh, people have shorthanded it to the speed of computer chips doubles every two years, which is really an outcome of doubling the density of, of uh, transistors on the chip. But uh, Moore's law has been very good over a 40-year period. It's been a very solid predictor about the change in the, um, in the capacity and speed of electronic devices. And it also, you can flip it around to, to realize that it also predicts how quickly electronics become obsolete and how quickly electronics reduce in size and how quickly electronics reduce in price. So it's a kind of a cool model. I really like Moore's Law. But if we think about the things that we do in GIS and you think about how Moore's Law might apply to it, the technology we use in GIS 
of all the things we do, has the least half-life. It becomes obsolete the most quickly. But think about these other elements, data and partnerships and policy and training. Those have much longer half-lives. Now, I started my career at the New York DOT. When I got there in 1984, they had already built these data systems from the 1960s for traffic accidents, highway pavement condition, maintenance records, and so on. And those data systems, what we did in those early days with GIS is figure out how to connect them to the map using something called linear referencing. Now, I don't want to bore you with technology here, but basically it's the Velcro between the way data is represented in those highway databases and GIS. And 25 years later, they're still using those same data systems. Yeah, the software is, is, is newer, and the databases are newer, but somebody time traveling from today back to, back, even back to the 1960s would recognize that data. That data has, is, is what runs the New York DOT and every other DOT. So, very powerful reminder to me of the lasting value of data. Partnerships, you know, uh, Frank and I, we working in an office, started an orthoimmetry program in 2001. And the core of that program was the state was going to buy some base level products and then allow counties to pay for some upgrades. They could get higher resolution, they could get additional products, they could get color infrared and some other things as, as little buy-up options for just the delta cost. That model was a hit from day one. Here we are 18 years later, and that same partnership model is still humming along just like the day we laid it out. And I, unless some dramatic change occurs, I, I see it continuing well into the future. Policies, if they're well crafted, are independent of technology. So you're not writing policies that talk about using version X of software Y. They're talking about the workflow and the obligations attached to that workflow, independent of policy. And those, when they're well done, last can last indefinitely. You know, in government, policies once you put them in place, can almost, they almost self-perpetuate and, and continue into the future. In some cases in a bad way, but... Uh, I, and then finally, the investment, you, the investments you make in your team. You invest in your team to get them around solid workflows. Those become the building blocks for the data that you build and the systems that you build. And so that, that investment in people has lasting value too. Because you can get a whole career's worth of high quality work out of someone that you've invested in at the early point in their career. So the point of this is to realize that you should spend your time on the things that have the most lasting value. And that's usually going to translate into these things and less on the technology. Now, I'm not anti-technology. I don't want you to misinterpret my remarks here. I like to use a hiking analogy. And I think of what you do here as a hiking trip. Are you going to convince anybody to join you on your hiking trip by talking about your hiking boots? The hiking boots are your technology. You need them. You're not going to hike barefoot. You, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get there very well barefoot. So you, you've got to have them. But nobody is going to get excited by learning the details of your hiking boots. What they're going to get excited about they're going to make a decision about whether to join you or not on this hiking trip by you're talking about the summit that you're going to reach and how great it's going to feel when you get to that peak. So keep that in mind and keep technology in its rightful place. Pardon me for just a moment. So we've gone through the ingredients that you need. We've talked about the components, the vision component, the stakeholders, the strategic plan that gives you your journey there. Those are the ingredients. We've talked about the leadership skills that are going to help you get there. And so now the question is, what are you going to do about it? That's a question that you're going to have to answer. It may not feel like you're at a fork in the road, but you are. Down one path is the status quo, which is what you have going on now. 
Down the other fork is the Emerald City. However you want to define that Emerald City. Think about the power that you could unleash if you were all working together. This is New York City we're talking about. We aren't talking about Topeka. Not that there's anything wrong with Topeka. But total, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is one of the most important cities in the world. This is a place that has a density of talent and resources and potential unrivaled anywhere. Are you going to put that potential together and define together what you could do? Think about that. Think about how you could show the world how to achieve greatness with GIS. Seize that opportunity, New York. Carpe Geo. Thank you.